this day. And so we recognize that it's not all about ourselves, but at some point we will pass the baton to the next generation. And uh, that's what we're about, Lador of Ador, from one generation to the next. So do me a favor, extend your arms toward them and lift them up as we pray over the girls. We say scripturally over you, Yisimech Elohim, Kesara, Rivka, Rachel, Leah. May God make each one of you girls like Sarah and Rebecca, Rachel and Leah, the blessed mothers of Israel. And for the boys, Yisimcha Elohim, Ki Ephraim, May God make each one of you boys like Ephraim and Manasseh as you build up Israel in your generation. Lord, they may not fully understand all that encompasses, but we do. And so, Lord, we pray that prophetic destiny into their hearts, into their spirit, into their very lives. May they be a blessing to their parents, Lord, and may they grow up to be straight azechaim, trees of life within a tree of life. Bless their socks off in Shabbat school and as they worship with us. In the name of Yeshua. Amen. 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 Kids, good to see you. <laughs> Hallelujah. As we open the ark of the Lord today, as we had an opportunity last week to open up the scroll and to learn a little bit about it, as we've come through an intense period of high holy days and fall feasts, uh, it was a wonderful time. And I trust that the Lord did some mighty things in and through you over the last five, six weeks. And we're back into a a regular rhythm, like if I could say that. We don't want it to ever be regular. But we're back to our study in the Gospel of Luke, which we'll do a little later. But first, let's open the ark and Process it through the community today. His word is near us. It's even in our mind. It's in our heart. We can do it. Vayhi ben soah Aaron, vayomer Moshe, kuma Adonai, veafutsu hohi vecha, vehanusu. Mi sanecha, mi panecha. Ki mi tzion, teitzehe Torah. Ki mi tzion, teitzehe Torah. Udvar Adonai. Mi Yerusha Lahayim Baruch Shenatan Torah Torah Baruch Shenatan Torah Torah Le Amo Yisrael Behik do who shut.
are conquering. And on that day, his sword will go forth to take back and restore what belongs. What belongs to our Lord. Preparing the way of the Lord, beckoning the day when Israel will say, Baruch Baba Shem Adonai. bless you. We thank you. The Shema is the anthem of our people. It's the declaration of our faith. It's the pledge of allegiance to our one God. And so we pray it this morning. In the word of God, it potentially is the only prayer when we lie down and when we rise up. And so join with me from Deuteronomy 6 verse 4 and forward. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Boruch Shem Kivod Mahalchuto Leolam Vahed. Hero Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be the name of his glorious Malchut, his kingdom, which is forever and ever. The passage goes on to say, V'yahavta et Adonai Elohecha, v'chol levavcha, v'chol nafshecha, v'chol meodecha. V'hayu hadvarim ha'ele, asher anochi mitzavcha hayom ha'levavecha. V'shinantam levanecha, v'dibarta bam, v'shivtecha bevetecha, v'vlechtecha v'aderech, v'shach becha v'kumecha. V'kshartam le'ot al yadecha, v'hayu letotofot b'en einecha. Uchtavtam al mizuzot beitecha, uvi sharecha. Amen. It's always good to be in the house. It is. To be in a place where we can worship and praise and set aside the weight of the week and just honor his name. Amen.
keep you my compass, my lifeline, my whole heart until the end. I'm returning to the place where God runs for you. There's no substitute, no other.
build my life I know that with everything that's going on in the world with so much chaos and angst and anger and fear we have to remember that we have a sure foundation and if we are built if we have built our lives and our faith on that foundation then it doesn't matter what the storm says. It doesn't matter how hard it rages. But we are secure. No matter that the sands and and things around us shift and crumble and fall, He is our hope.
salvation and I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken and I will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation and I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken I will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation and I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken oh, I will not be shaken oh, you're my firm foundation oh, I will not be shaken oh,
solid rock. When the wind buffets and blows and shakes the windows, I know I'm standing firm. I'm standing secure in you. When I've done all the stand, I stand. from the grave. I have called you forth and put a foundation before you. I have set my word within you to raise you above all obstacles, to make you triumphant in everything. For I have overcome the world yes. and I am with you until the end. If you endure with me, you shall see the King of glory seated on the throne. You shall see great and mighty things. For I have prepared a place for you. And I am coming, coming for every one of you to show you my love, my compassion, my word, my faithfulness. For I am true and faithful. Take 60 seconds, go to your neighbor, lay your hand on them, begin to pray, begin to intercede for them. Just begin to pray the mercies of God and the promises of God into their lives, a destiny and a hope and a future. Begin to prophesy, begin to encourage, begin to stretch forth the gifts of the Spirit.
receive it, Lord. says his house should be a house of prayer for all nations. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, team. <laughs> Last couple of weeks in the community here, we've just been dealing with a lot of stuff. Most of it you don't even know about. It's a lot of people under pressure, under attack, whether it's their bodies or their jobs and their households. But greater is he that's within us than he that's within the world. If you have your scriptures, open up with me this morning to Kohelet, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 18. One verse this morning, Solomon writes, Additionally, everyone to whom God has given riches and wealth and empowers him to eat from it, to receive his share and to rejoice in his labor, even this is a gift of God. You see, having great power, having great wealth, having great possessions does not by itself grant personal happiness, right? We know that. Now, being content and happy with what we have and what we achieve begins with God and it ends with God. Without God as the central focus of our lives, happiness is elusive. God forbid happiness is even non-existent without him. Those of you who might be here for the first time visiting or the second time, I want to put a free book into your hands that will give you a, a quick understanding of who we are, why we do what we do. Just quickly put up your hand. I'm going to put a book into your hand, ushers, if uh, if there are any here, a few I see on the corners here, thank you for being with us today. You could be doing a lot of other things. You've chosen to be with us, and we so appreciate that. Um, we get a touch from the Lord every time we're here in Mishpucha and family in our community. I ask you to take out an offering envelope off of your seat in front of you, and you can make a tax-deductible Donation out to Tree of Life. Fill in the information on the envelope. We can give you an annual giving statement in January for your taxes. Or if you don't need that, you can give anonymously as well. That works too. You can give on, on the app. Uh, those who are members here uh, are matriculated onto an app, and it goes directly to our, our PayPal platform. And you, those watching online, we don't want to forget you. We know uh, people are watching from uh, Canada and from Wisconsin and uh, from other parts of San Diego, couldn't be here. Maybe you're, uh, you're, you're traveling today, and so we appreciate you logging on and being with us today. So let's join in a word of prayer over these finances. Father, we thank you and bless you today. Lord, for blessing us that we might be able to give and to distribute. Lord, you've established your covenant in the earth. You've blessed us so much, Lord, and we've got needs, Lord, as we look around, and Lord, we are blessed to meet those needs, whether it's of the facility, whether it's in the people's lives that need a little uh, trampoline bump up, oh God, we thank you today for all that you've done in and through us. We've never been broke a day in our lives as a community, Lord, because you move on hearts. We don't put a hard sell on anybody. We don't have annual membership dues. Whatever, Lord, you put on our hearts to give, we will do. And so we bless you out of Zion today in our giving. B'shem Yeshua HaMashiach. 
Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, ushers. While the ushers are receiving God's tithe and our offering, take a quick look at your bulletins in the app, or there were some bulletins handed out as you arrived. I'm excited about this coming Thursday night. Listen, the men have been gathering here in the house on Tuesday nights for prayer since January, and we've had an incredible time. Men, can you say amen to that? We've had an, every week is a very different thing. We don't know what the Lord desires to do, but we're growing as men. We're growing in the Lord. We're growing in our relationship with God. We're growing in prayer. And so we want to do this with the ladies of the house. And so uh, Thursday evening at Regina Cooper's home, you can see the address there in the bulletin from 7 to 8 o'clock. If you want to come a little early for some fellowship, that'd be wonderful too. And we've got a great set of ladies who will be... Uh, facilitating prayer among the women. Uh, we have modeled to you as men uh, that we are consistent and that we are not stopping. And so we just know that uh, uh, if we can pray, we know the ladies, of course, uh, can pray. And we know you desire to pray. And we know that we desire to see God answer these prayers. So you, you can take a look at your bulletin on that. I'm going to ask you to uh, keep me in prayer uh, next Saturday after this service. I'm going to have to catch a plane to the East Coast for annual MJAA Executive Committee and IAMCS Steering Committee meetings. I'll be chairing the Executive Committee side, and I'm the Director of Operations for the Steering Committee, and it's always a great time to be with 25 Messianic leaders, half a dozen of which are attorneys, sitting in a cold room in Florida for four straight long days. But no, it's actually, it's a blessing because God gives us vision not only for the organization for the next coming year, but really for the future of the Messianic movement through the Messianic Jewish Alliance of America. We've got some exciting new business to talk about. I'm going to ask you to keep us in prayer, to keep us healthy through the meetings. And, um, and I appreciate that as well. You can take a look at various things coming up. Uh, Hebrew class will be beginning immediately following this service in this room as well. And we're back in our study of the Gospel of Luke. Before we do that, I want to call up Diane Hickman with our monthly Salt and Light Council uh, announcements. And if you'd give Diane a warm welcome. Diane, come on up. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to draw your attention to the Salt and Light um, portion of our app that gives you all the information that you need that I'm going to speak about briefly. I'd like to remind you about the lecture series. Kurt Bowers, filmmaker, speaker, businessman, will be the speaker on Monday the 18th. You can register through the app, and also I have the, um, the website that you can look at. Then at the table, there are a couple of uh, issues that are important that you can write postcards about, so that's important to know. I also want to bring your attention to something very local, that there's an election, the Mesa City Council there is an election where Laura Lothian is the candidate who's, who's being endorsed by Reform California and the Republican Party of San Diego County here in La Mesa. One of her issues among many that are relevant to us is that she's working on stop the mileage tax. As of right now, the La Mesa City Council is in favor of a mileage tax. So they're actually doing a walk tomorrow and people are asked to walk door to door and encourage voters to come out and vote for Laura at the city, for the city council. And uh, anybody wants to walk with me and I appreciate that. If not, then not. But again, please look at the um, app and that'll give you all the information that we need. 
So um, I also want to share with you that our wonderful rabbi, Joel, has given me a very encouraging word that is that we shouldn't be discouraged, that I shouldn't be discouraged by looking at the giants in the land. And there are giants in the land, but I am encouraged to not look at the not look at the giants in the land and do the kind of faith, exercise the faith that Joshua and Caleb did in order to get into the land. And we have lots of giants in this land. It's hard not to see them. So pay attention to what's going on in our government. Stay in prayer for our country. Do all the activities that are available to us to support the biblical uh, necessary things to return our government to a biblical position. So I'm looking forward to seeing you at the table, and thank you for all that. Thank you, Diane. Appreciate you. Thank you. I think more relevantly, Diane was considering the giants in the land of Israel, but yes, there are plenty here, too. I'm going to ask you this morning um, to open up your scriptures to where we left off weeks ago. We're back in our study in the Gospel of Luke. I wanted to uh, mention to you another book that just came out. Uh, books like this are probably less than two handfuls in the world, uh, the history of the Messianic Jewish movement. A colleague of mine down in uh, Guadalajara, Mexico, he leads a Messianic synagogue there, uh, Rabino Manuel Hernandez Gomez. He's an author and a journalist, an attorney as well, has a master's degree in theology, the author of 30 books, co-author of 10 more works. He works on history, essays, stories, and narratives, part of these books are part of the collections of the great universities around the world. The Hebrew University of Jerusalem carries his books, Harvard, Yale, Stanford, UCLA, Tulane, Columbia, Princeton, Duke, Brown, etc. And he's written a book. I just want to read you a couple of sentences from the back of the book, The History of Messianic Judaism. Contrary to what many people consider, the historical reality confirms and teaches us that Messianic Judaism, in addition to being the oldest current of Judaism... The book was, by the way, just recently translated from Spanish to English, so it's a little bit, in some places, interesting to, to read in English. The oldest stream of Judaism, we could say, is also the origin and theological support of Christianity. For two millennia, Jewish and Christian leaders have invented an endless series of myths and fallacies. The former, to rid themselves of their brother for believing that Yeshua is the Messiah, as announced by the patriarchs and prophets, while the latter have promoted violent and bloody stages of anti-Semitism to remain with the vineyard, so that between them they have almost managed to make disappear his footprint and presence. The history of Messianic Judaism is enriching in various ways and helps to illuminate with greater intensity that the divine truth revealed in the Holy Scriptures is the path of God's people, allowing Jews to understand and reconcile various aspects of their ancient faith that is generally unknown to them, as well as allowing Christians to discover the Jewish roots and foundations of their beliefs. So I began reading this the other day, and I'm really fascinated, especially by the most recent hundred years of the early Messianic movement beginning in the mid-1860s up to the present. Fantastic history and prophetic, and uh, I may be sharing more in the weeks to come from this book. I want to speak to you for a little bit today about prophetic drama. How many of you like drama? We've had a dramatic week uh, here and in the world as we do each week. Prophetic drama on the way to and in the temple. And so we're back in our extended study of the book of Luke. So good to see some of you back from quarantine. I'm, I'm checking off those of you who are back. You are the first ones to come back. And so I know more will be behind you next week coming back from COVID quarantine. And uh, you, didn't, you didn't hear who it was. So don't look, turn around. You don't know who I'm talking about. I could be talking about you. I could be talking about anybody. But um, soon after the 
the events that we talked about several weeks ago of Yeshua's entry into Jerusalem, Jerusalem, he embarks on a course of action that bring him into conflict with the Jewish religious leadership of the nation. Listen, if you are a member in Messianic Jewish synagogues, you are going to be in conflict with maybe your family, maybe your neighbors. How many of you have experienced that conflict? Yes. Well, I'm with you, and I'm the coach, and I'm, I'm rooting for you in this process. Well, let's pick it up in Luke chapter 19, verse 45. Then Yeshua entered the temple and began to drive out the merchants, saying to them, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And he was teaching every day in the temple. The ruling Kohanim, the priests and the Torah scholars, even the leaders of the people were trying to destroy him, but they could not find any way to do it because all the people were hanging on his words. So as Yeshua and his Talmudim, his disciples, entered the city, they went directly to the center of Adonai's spiritual universe, the temple, the temple mount. This was a bustling hub of activity for the tens of thousands of Jewish people who lived in the vicinity, and it was even more crowded as the major festivals, in this case of Passover, would be approaching. Now, guys, if you could just uh, put up that temple floor plan. This is just a basic model you'll find in many Bibles. I encourage you to pick up a Bible atlas, which are, has much more detail than this particular. Maybe it's hard to see. Uh, we need to understand the layout of the temple in order to understand and see what was happening in this set of scriptures. You can take a look at this map. It's fascinating. I'm looking at a Bible atlas myself, a sheet from that, various courts of Israel, which we want to talk about, the various furnishings within the various courts, the various rooms where the Sanhedrin met, the alms boxes were at. There was a wood room, a wine and oil room. There was a room for the Nazarites, there was women's viewing balconies, there was a room for lepers. Uh, most of this is not shown in this particular one, but you can get a general idea of what we're talking about, and you can leave that up. And so the temple sat upon Mount Zion and was thought to have covered about 30 acres of land. It consisted of two parts, actually, the temple building itself and the temple courtyards. The temple building itself was a relatively small structure, it sat in the center of the temple property. It included the uh, holy place, as well as Kodesh HaKodeshim, the most holy place, holy of holies. And the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, could enter its walls, and he could enter it just once during the year, right, on Yom Kippur, which we just uh, celebrated. The temple precincts were four courtyards, as you can see which surrounded the temple building, each decreasing in their importance to the Jewish mind. Great walls would separate the courts from each other. We see that there was the inner court of the priests. Within that court stood great furnishings of worship. We had the altar of burnt offering. We have the brazen laver. We have the seven-branched candelabrum, the lampstand, the altar of incense, and the table of showbread. The, courts, the court of the Israelites was next. Jewish worshipers met together for joint services there during the Chagim, during the festivals. It was where also where worshipers handed over their sacrifices to the Kohanim. There were slaughtering rooms there. We find the court of the women, the third courtyard in the diagram here. Women were usually limited to this area except for worship. And finally, the exterior court of the Gentiles, which was the last courtyard, it surrounded all the other ones and was the place of worship for all Gentile converts to Judaism. And so it was in the court of the Gentiles where so much commercialism was taking place and may have been the place where this event that we're reading about today took place. You see, there was a regular commercial market going on within its walls. How did a commercial market ever get into the temple of God? One reason, greed. You see, worshipers needed animals. They needed sheep. They needed oxen. They needed 
doves, etc. They needed incense, they needed meal, they needed wine, they needed oil, salt, and other items for their sacrifices and offerings. Jewish pilgrims from foreign nations would need money exchanged to pay the temple tax, a half shekel. And at some point in the history of the temple, the Kohanim, the priests, decided to take advantage of the market themselves instead of letting retailers on the outside reap all of the profits. And so the priests began to set up booths within the court of the Gentiles and to lease out space to outside retailers. So Yeshua is fully aware of this. And he objects to the use of temple grounds for these purposes. It's interesting, according to the prophet Zechariah in chapter 14, verse 21, it says this, In that day, that is messianic days, there will no longer be a merchant in the house of Adonai Tzvaot, the Lord of hosts. And so by Yeshua's expelling the merchants from the temple area, he's fulfilling that prophecy. And in effect, what's he doing? He's saying that he was the Messiah. Can you just picture for a moment in your mind's eye Yeshua walking through the tables of the merchants, driving them out, along with those who are buying and selling, driving them out too? My friends, Yeshua was not some 98-pound weakling who was afraid of his own shadow. He was strong enough to storm through that area of the temple courts like a tornado. Now, we know that the problem that infuriated Yeshua was not the business of changing money or selling animals for sacrifice. These were necessary components of the system. Yeshua objected because the, the Kohanim, the priests, were charging exorbitant exchange rates. The Kohanim were the only ones who could approve the animals, could approve the coins, so they required these be exchanged for their approved animals and their approved coins. By the way, for a hefty fee, of course. You see the scam? They had a corner on the market so they could charge whatever they wanted. That's why the concession stand at the movie theaters today can charge you 15 bucks for popcorn and a soda. They don't allow you to bring your own, so they could charge whatever they want. Now, some folks have used these verses to justify their belief that they should never sell anything in a congregation. No books, no Judaica, no Bibles, etc. Remember, Yeshua did not say you have made this place a house of selling. He said what? You have made it a den of thieves. It was the dishonest extortion that caused Yeshua to clean house. Maybe we'll have a two-for-one sale after this. I don't know (laughs) on our stuff there. Okay, um. Too often we assume that the terrible offense was, again, was doing any kind of business in the temple precincts. Quite the contrary. The Torah even mandated that the needs of the pilgrims coming up for the festivals must be met so that they could properly worship. You see, it was a requirement for all Jewish men coming up to the temple for these three main pilgrimage festivals. What? Pesach, right? Passover, Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, and Sukkot, but to bring the agricultural tithe from their labors to the temple to celebrate before the Lord. Now, obviously, this could be a hardship if one didn't live uh, very close to Jerusalem, to the temple. They were trying to travel. They were coming from abroad in the first century. They would have to have several carts of produce. So in the Torah, God provides a logical adaptation for them. We find it in Torah, Deuteronomy chapter 14. He made provision for those coming from far distances. And he says this in verse 24, Deuteronomy 14. Moses writes, Now suppose the way is too long for you, for you cannot carry the tithe, because the place Adonai your God chooses to set his name is too far for you. When Adonai your God blesses you, then you are to exchange the agricultural tithe for silver, 
Bind up the silver in your hand and go to the place that Adonai your God chooses. You may spend the money for whatever your soul desires, cattle, sheep, wine, strong drink, or whatever your soul asks of you. Then you will eat there before Adonai your God and rejoice you and your household. And so the money changers fulfilled this important job for all Jews who were coming from abroad with pagan money, often with images of idols on the money or images of Caesar minted on the coins. And such graven images could not be used to pay the the temple tax or to purchase a kosher offering. And so the money changers' service was necessary to convert pagan money to Jewish Shkalim, shekels, currency. But something very terrible that day was happening, my friends. Something was very, very wrong that day in the temple courts as Yeshua confronted these merchants. And his quote of the Tanakh clarifies why he's so upset. My house shall be a house of prayer. Speaking of the main purpose of the Beit Hamikdash. The temple, the kehilah, the congregation, in a sense, must be a place of prayer where God's people can encounter him and can experience his presence in this way. My friends, either we will allow the Messiah into our congregations and our worship services to purify us as his people, to drive out deceit, to drive out immorality, to drive out irreverence, to drive out corruption, to drive out worldliness, or Messiah is going to clean his house with judgment at his second coming. You choose. And so we see that there were several factors that contributed to the priestly aristocracy's desire to kill off Yeshua. They viewed him as a messianic charlatan, a messianic pretender, a blasphemer. They lost control of the masses due to his popularity. And they feared that civil unrest was going to go down during the upcoming Feast of Passover, which would lead to violent reprisals from Rome. They presumably believed as well that Adonai had authorized them rather than someone else to be in charge of the religious aspects of the temple. And so he begins here, Yeshua, to teach from the prophet Isaiah about the house of God. And it begs the question for us today, where does God live? Several answers come to mind. Number one, if you're taking some notes and in the app as well. Adonai lives in various addresses. One of the cool apps on our smartphones and tablets is Google Maps, right? Right? You can enter any address into the search field, and not only will it pinpoint your location, that location on a map, in many cases, it shows you a photograph, photograph of the house, for example, if you're going somewhere. And that feature is called Google Street View. Since 2007, Google has covered the globe with millions of employees and cars mounted with 360-degree cameras on their cars on a pole on top of the car. They've taken over a billion photos of houses, and businesses, and neighborhoods. And actually, they created a controversy back then over privacy issues because sometimes the pictures would capture people, too. And so they, Google had to then blur out you know, faces. They had to blur out vehicle tags and so on. Well, I did this, and I entered the address of my home, our home, and there was a color picture of our house and our neighbor's houses. It was pretty cool. But let's imagine for a moment that we're going to look at God's house. What address would we type into the search field? (laughs) Where does God live today? Well, of course, we know that Adonai is omnipresent, right? This means he's every place, he's everywhere. But the scripture teaches that throughout history, the Shekhinah, the glory of Adonai's presence, had resided in several houses or temples. Let's do a quick tour of the different houses that God had occupied. Well, first, there was the Mishkan, the tabernacle, right, that Moses had constructed when our people were making their way out of Egypt to the promised land. The the Shekinah, the glory of Adonai, was present there in the Kodesh, Kodeshim, into the Holy of Holies there. We call it a, a tabernacle, which is just another word for tent. 
But the actual Hebrew word mishkan means residence. This was Adonai's residence from about 1437 BCE until 957 BCE. It was his residence. The next house of God was Solomon's temple built at 957 BCE. The Ark of the Covenant that had been in the Mishkan was transferred now to a more stable structure. The temple was God's address, his residence, until the Babylonians ransacked Jerusalem, destroyed the temple in 586 BCE. God's next address was the same location but a different house. Our Jewish people, as you know, returned back to Jerusalem from Babylonian captivity, rebuilt the temple 70 years later in 516 BCE. But the second temple was rather drab compared to Solomon's. But about 45 years before Yeshua was born, Herod the Great undertook an extreme makeover of the temple. And it took them about 50 years to upgrade the temple to the majestic appearance that it had during the days of Yeshua. Herod created a huge flat area where people could gather called these temple courtyards. Thousands could gather there. It was large enough for thousands of people to worship and to gather. And this is where Yeshua taught in these courtyards and where he drove out these money changers and other merchants. You see, only Kohanim could enter the temple area. Yeshua wasn't a Kohen. So he never actually entered the actual temple. But that wasn't a problem because Yeshua was the perfect temple of God. Shaul writes this, For God, Adonai, was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Yeshua. Colossians 1.19 Yeshua knew he was Adonai's temple because he said, quote, destroy this temple, destroy Yeshua's body, and in three days I will raise it up. When the Judean leaders heard that, they said, what, 46 years this temple was being built and you will raise it in three days? Yochanan's gospel, John's gospel goes on to say this, quote, but he was talking about the temple of his body. And so Yeshua's prophecy was correct. They crucified him, and in three days, he was raised to life. But all of that, my friends, is history, isn't it? Where does God live today? Surprise or no surprise, today... Tell her what she's won. God lives in us. Adonai has both a collective address, the body of Messiah, and Adonai has an individual address, we as followers of Yeshua. Now let's unpack that collective and individual address for a moment. Let's talk about the collective. Adonai lives in us as the kehila, as the body. The Brit Chadashah, the New Covenant Scriptures, teach that Adonai lives collectively in all the followers of Yeshua collectively who make up the, the Ecclesia, the Kehillah, the body of the Messiah. When Yeshua was living here on planet Earth for 33 years approximately, he had a body. Yeshua still has a body, the Kehillah. Shaul or Paul writes this, quote, For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Here's an easy way to remember this. Write this down. This is for free, by the way. No charge on this one, because I'm convicted about this extortion situation. In the Tanakh, Adonai had a temple for his people. And in the Brit Chadashah scriptures, Adonai has a people for his temple. Let me repeat that. In the Tanakh scriptures, Adonai had a temple for his people. In the Brit Chadashah scriptures, Adonai had a people for his temple. Adonai lives in the hearts of his people. Amen? You see, people today still mistake the congregational house as Adonai's dwelling. 
Sometimes people actually revere congregational buildings as if they're more holy, as if they're more special than any other building. Friends, this was a Fuddruckers. Now, some might consider it holy if you're a meat eater. I hear you. Adonai does not live in bricks. He doesn't live in mortar. He doesn't live in steel. Friends, the early Kehillah for hundreds of years didn't have buildings. They didn't meet in buildings for the first 300 years of the faith. Now, there may come a day where we will be prohibited even from worshiping in this building. These are giants in the land, but that's what we're talking about. But let's talk about the individual address of God. Adonai lives in you and me as individual Yeshua followers. Not only does Adonai live in his people collectively, he also dwells within each Yeshua follower individually. Think about that. Stop and think about that statement for a second. If you embrace that truth, it will change the way you think about yourself. It will change the way you think about every other fellow believer. Shaul writes this, quote, or don't you know that your body is a temple of Ruach HaKodesh who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Well, we, what do we hear today a lot? We hear, it's my body and I can do with it whatever I please. Right? If you're a child of God, you can't say that. You are not your own. We're to honor Adonai with our bodies. The most life-changing truth I've ever discovered is that the bottom line of the messianic life is this. Messiah in me. God with me. It's great, isn't it? It's comforting. God with me. Fantastic. God for me. Love it. Encouraging. But God living in me is transformational. Your entire life will be radically changed when you start to grasp the impact of what Colossians 127 says. God chose to make this known, this glorious, he calls it a glorious mystery, which is Messiah in you, the hope of glory. Now, I'm not talking about that New Age philosophy Make no mistake about it, my friends, that claims that God is in me, God is in you, God is in that tree, God is in that song. The new age is just the old age heresy with a Hollywood hairdo. <laughs> Pantheism is a pagan philosophy that taught that God is the life force that resides in every person and everything. That's not true. But it is true that Yeshua is standing at the door of your heart and asking to come into your life. If you open the door of your heart, he comes in to live in you, and your body is a temple of Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. Yeshua dwells in every believer, but not in every body. With those amazing truths, and they are amazing to me, let me make a couple of applications about what happens when Yeshua rules in us, his temple. In other words... How the things Yeshua did in the temple courts that day in Jerusalem, right before Passover, are the things he wants to do in you and in me today. When Yeshua rules in us, a couple of things happen. Number one, like what happened here, Yeshua drives out dishonesty. We read from that passage, Yeshua entered the temple, right, and began to drive out the merchants. And we can see paintings all throughout history of this event. Some people think about the event and ask, well, didn't Yeshua get angry here? Isn't that sin? Well, Yeshua was, like us, filled with righteous indignation. Doesn't that sound spiritual? It sounds great. 
I was righteously indignant with my wife yesterday. It sounds so spiritual, doesn't it? I was, I'm just saying, but it sounds great. He was filled with righteous indignation. His anger wasn't directed at the people. It was directed at the injustice and the dishonesty. Again, let me repeat, there was a certain amount of commerce that had to take place on the Temple Mount. Again, pilgrims from other countries had to change their coins into the Jewish shekel because it would have been blasphemy to offer a coin with a graven image stamped on it. But the money changers, again, charged exorbitant prices to exchange the money. Pilgrims had to have animals for their sacrifices, but the crooked merchants were in cahoots with the corrupt priests. You see, if a pilgrim brought a lamb from his home, a priest, what did a priest, he had to approve that before it was offered as a sacrifice. The priest would disallow the lamb, direct the pilgrim to his buddy running a business selling approved lambs. The pilgrim would then trade in the lamb, pay more money, and then the lamb dealer, what would he do? He would turn around and sell the lamb that the priest had earlier declared unacceptable. Cha-ching! It's good business. That's what Yeshua was upset about. Reminds us that I remember when I started paying attention to hurricanes, I started really paying attention to them in the early 90s because of a book that was written called Eye to Eye by a White House correspondent that tracked every hurricane in terms of our response as a nation governmentally to, to Israel. It was a fascinating study. But back in Hurricane Andrew, when it blew through South Florida in 1992, it left, you remember, a trail of devastation. But a week after the hurricane, a sheet of plywood that normally would sell or that previously sold for $9.95 sold for $29.95. One sheet of plywood. A gallon of water, which had previously sold before Andrew of $0.49, cents, was now selling for $6.95. We can call it price gouging, call it whatever you want. It's now illegal in most states. That's the kind of robbery and extortion that ignited the indignation of Yeshua here. The worshipers had nowhere else to purchase these items for the temple, so the merchants could charge and did whatever they wanted to. It's like buying a pizza at Petco Park. You can get one, but it'll cost you 40 bucks. I wonder how Yeshua feels about that. When Yeshua rules in a kehilah, in a congregation, it is a temple of truth. Truth is taught. Truth is practiced. When Yeshua rules in your temple, he drive, in my temple, he drives out dishonesty as well. You see, for a follower of Yeshua, honesty, as it is always said, is not only the best policy, it's the only policy. You will want to tell the truth. You will want to treat people fairly because Yeshua lives in you. You can tell a lie as a believer. And I'm going to be honest with you here. I can't remember the last time I told a lie except a couple of weeks ago. My wife and I were driving to this Republican convention event I was speaking at. And I was warned by the person inviting me that there's no parking downtown at this hotel. You're not going to get any parking. And we're coming into the thing, and, and I drive up to the hotel and the underground parking, and, and the attendant says to me, are you checking into the hotel? And I said, yes. <laughs> and I hadn't planned to check into the hotel. He says, well, go on through. There's some spaces for guests. And I can't remember the last time I had lied, but I, I, I was put under pressure I didn't know, I couldn't, there was no part, there was no self-parking in that part of downtown. And my wife was all over me, but the Holy Spirit was all over me. You see, when that happens, the Holy Spirit has a fit. And you experience his internal conviction. So how did I justify it? Well, I picked my ticket up from the guy and drove about 10 seconds and said, I don't think I'm, I'm going to check into the hotel today. I, that's a justification. Yeshua said that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. And when Yeshua rules in us, another thing happens too. Not only does he drive out dishonesty, but he promotes our prayer. 
He quotes here, Yeshua does from Isaiah chapter 56 and says, God says, my house shall be a house of prayer. Yeshua wants every congregation to be a house of prayer. Not the building, but the people. In the temple, worship, what was happening? There was music, right? There was sacrifices. There was teaching. There was offerings. There was fellowship. But Adonai never said his house would be a house of singing. He never said his house will be will be a house of offering, or even a house of teaching. He said it was to be a house of prayer for all the nations. Not just the Jewish people, but for all people. And as an individual temple, Yeshua wants to make you and he wants to make me a house of prayer. I hope a lot of you ladies take advantage of this opportunity that we be beginning on Thursday night. I believe one of the best barometers to gauge our spiritual health is our prayer life. When people talk about you, or when they talk about me, do they ever say he or she is a real prayer warrior? Or she is a prayer warrior? Well, this happened nearly 2,000 years ago. Again, there is a 21st century lesson, I believe, that we can all learn. And here's the lesson. Yeshua has a right, he has the right, a right, the right, to clean out and to clean up his temple. When Yeshua said, my house shall be a house of prayer, he's speaking with a sense of ownership. It was his house. Think about that. It was his house. My friends, if you decide to come over to our house and decide to dump garbage in the middle of our living room, Or rather, dump garbage in your own living room. I don't have the right to tell you to stop that in your own home, do I? But if you come over to our house and you start dumping garbage on our floor, I would tell you to stop. Actually, Darcy would tell you first, and you don't want to have to deal with her as opposed to me. The reason Yeshua cleared out the temple was because the temple was the house of God and Yeshua is God. Where's the house of God today? Where do you find God's temple on earth today? It's not this building. It's not any building. It's this building. Again, let me repeat what Shaul wrote. He said this, or don't you know that your body is a temple of Ruach Kodesh who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. My friends, I love, I really do, I love this physical building. Why? It's a place we can gather. It's a place we can worship together. However, it would be better for you to defile this building than to defile your body. Why? Because your body, the steel is not, your body is a temple of Ruach HaKodesh. Paul wrote those words in 1 Corinthians 6 because some followers of Yeshua back then thought they could somehow separate their spirit from their bodies and they were still engaging in the use of prostitutes, which was part of the fertility cult of Corinth. Paul said, no, you can't do that. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, sometimes we think about only the negative ways we defile God's temple, right? Drug abuse, sex outside of marriage, tobacco, alcohol, etc. But you could also defile Adonai's temple by not properly caring for it. We have a spiritual responsibility to exercise and eat right. We've got to keep Adonai's temple healthy. Hear my heart, friends. Would you be willing to say, Lord, just as you cleaned out your temple in Jerusalem, would you clean up this temple? Let's read on. Verse 1, chapter 20. On one of those days... While Yeshua was teaching the people in the temple and proclaiming the good news, 
the ruling Kohanim, the priests and the Torah scholars, together with the elders, confronted him. And they spoke, saying to him, tell us by what authority are you doing these things? Or who is the one who gave you this authority? But answering, Yeshua said to them, I also will ask you a question, and you, will tell, and you tell me. The immersion of John, was it from heaven or from men? Well, they reasoned among themselves, saying, if we say from heaven, he will say, why didn't you believe him? But if we say from men, then all the people will stone us because they are convinced that John is a prophet. So they answered that they didn't know where it came from. And Yeshua said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. First available opportunity for Yeshua's op for opposition to him, they questioned his teaching following his cleansing of the temple. And what we are really dealing with here, then and today, is the question of authority. My friends, hostility is often expressed when someone asks a question in public. Someone's angry, someone's upset, and they ask a question not to obtain the information, but to discredit the one being questioned. You ever see those presidential press conferences? That's what's happening a lot of times. These ruling Kohanim, these priests, the Torah scholars and elders wanted to publicly embarrass Yeshua, so they challenged his authority. They were demanding, who do you think you are? They were offended. They were angered because Yeshua condemned ungodly practices within God's house while they themselves tolerated that. And they actually participated in those practices. And Yeshua, by the way, if in our study, we've been studying this gospel since May of 2020. We've seen that Yeshua always, always, always answered sincere questions. When a Torah scholar asks him, which commandment is the first of all? He replies with the Shema. And that we love our neighbor as ourselves. But Yeshua never gave an answer to a trick question. Proverbs 26.4, this is a good nugget too, says this. Solomon writes, do not answer a fool according to his folly. Else you will also be like him. So when they served up their question to him that day, Yeshua fires back a forehand volley at their feet. He said, I'll answer you if you answer me. Had some topspin on that forehand. <laughs> Did Yochanan the immerser get his authority from God or from men? You see, he was bringing up the issue of agency in Jewish law. An authorized agent acted on behalf of the sender, backed by the sender's full authority. Bam! Credible volley back. If they said from God, then Yeshua would have said, well, why didn't you let him immerse you then? If they said from man, they say here that the leaders would have been attacked by the people because after John had been beheaded, he becomes a hero to the people. They regard him as a prophet of God. So Yeshua is saying this, the answer to my question is the same as the answer to your question. For you see, if John was of God, then that would verify that Yeshua came from God. Why? Because John said, I immerse you with water, but one is coming who is mightier than I am. I'm not worthy to untie the strap of his sandals. He will immerse you in Ruach HaKodesh and fire. So when John immersed Yeshua that day in the Jordan River, a voice came from heaven saying what? You are my son whom I love and you are. I am well pleased. With you, I'm well pleased. Pretty strong indication of the source of Yeshua's authority. Here's the application for us. April, if you come up. 21st century lesson for us. Is your ultimate source of authority from men or from God? There's a standard in the world today that everyone uses to determine what is truth and what is error. And one's basis for truth is either man's wisdom or God's word. The scriptures call man's wisdom the wisdom of this world. Friends, 
I think everyone in this room, everyone listening on the podcast should study, should learn, get as much education as you can, and we should never stop learning. But empirical knowledge and scientific fact will never change our life. There's a fundamental distinction between facts and truth. Two plus two equals four. It is a fact, but it won't change our life. On the other hand, Yeshua is alive. That is a truth that will change our lives. And not only will it change our lives, it will change our eternity. Is our ultimate source of authority from men or from God. Yet some people have chosen to reject the scriptures. It's an outdated book of fairy tales and myths, Rabbi Joel. They've designated their source of authority to be what, the other, what someone else has written, or what someone else has said, or in most cases, the source of, their, of authority is their own intelligence. Here's how you can tell the difference. <laughs> if you ask a follower of Yeshua what they think or believe about a moral issue, pick the moral issue. National defense, immigration, capital punishment, marriage, abortion, homosexual, pick it. The answer should be, the Bible says. You ask a self-proclaimed independent thinker what they think, what, it, what they think about an, or believe about an issue. They'll say, well, I think... Stand with me today. Without admitting it, they have actually made their mind their own God. It's still today, 2,000 years later, my friends, a question of authority. And you've got to answer Yeshua's question. Does what we read in this book come from God or come from man? That is the question the world is grappling with today. That is the question some tree of lifers are grappling with today. Maybe it's a question you listening are grappling with today. It's a question of authority. Father, I thank you for these scriptures. Your word is true and every man a liar. We trust your scriptures as the ultimate authority for our lives. It may not be convenient. It may go, immense, go against what our mind thinks about an issue. But this is the truth, and we stand on this foundation. As we sung earlier, we build our lives on this foundation. Listen, we are living in a day, literally the day, where we don't know what to believe. We got vaxxed people fighting against anti-vax. We got the same science. We got the same data. I've read 50-page position papers on both sides of that. We don't know what to believe, but I know what to believe. God tells us by his stripes we've been healed. Listen, if you get sick with COVID and you don't, you're not vaccinated, you're in a hospital and we have a couple that are in the hospital, you gotta go to this word for, for healing. You're not gonna look to your doctor. Praise God for doctors. They have a word. They don't have the alpha and the omega word. They don't have the olive and the top, but they have a word. God forbid any of us end up in the hospital over anything. But it's not going to shake this being my foundation. I'm not going to be with the Lord one day before he says I will. Now I pray that I'm around a long time. I've got a lot of things I want to do for the Lord. Well, he's going to have his own say on that. I remember... Over 20 years ago, we had, I had just uh, received ordination as a Messianic rabbi. I had come home. I was on cloud nine, and within a week, our worship leader, he was our cantor too, dropped dead in his home. And I'm in the hospital looking at his body, and his widow was looking at me going, Come on, man, you got to have some faith. Get on top of them like the scriptures. I didn't have that faith, nor did I believe in my heart that he wanted that. It 
was already in glory. He didn't want to be brought back in this mess. But God has your days numbered. He has my days numbered. And the question is, are we living for him today? Do we believe this word is foundation for our lives? Listen, I'm all about, listen, if you need some time, you need some space to get with God and to do your due diligence. I'm not all about say a, a prayer and the proper way to say it and you're in the kingdom. No, this is a lifetime of discipleship. You have to count the cost of this faith. It's going to require, as we saw, everything from us. It's not about fire insurance. It's about a lifestyle of discipleship. And by the way, if Yeshua suffered, we're going to suffer. Oh, that's not preached a lot. In this generation. But that's what we've signed up for. We're going to be blessed in this life. We're going to have overwhelming joy in this life. But it's also going to be some service. It's going to be some problems. It's going to be some suffering. Are you with me? I'm all in. I'm all in. I'm all in. Father, we thank you today. We bless you. We're all in, oh God, on you. We are laying ourselves out in your service. So, Lord, you've seen our hearts. We ask you to open up doors that no man can shut, close doors that no man can open. We choose to be like Joshua and Caleb and to be a good report in the land. We choose to see things the way you see them. We choose to believe, Lord, that you've got a good plan for the United States of America. We choose to believe, Lord God, that just as the Yeshua movement, the Jesus movement started on the West Coast in the late 60s, early 70s. We believe, Lord, we're overdue for another wave of revival, Lord. Let it start here, oh God, once again. Raise up the apostles. Raise up the prophets. Raise up the shepherds and teachers in this hour, Lord, to lead the charge. So God, we're all in. We thank you for your authority that you've given us here in your word. We bless you today. And as Moses told Aaron how to bless the sons and daughters of Israel, we love to close every service with that blessing. And so receive it the way that it was written in the Holy Scriptures. <laughs> Vaishma recha Ya era do nai pan velecha vi khuneka Isa do nai pan velecha vi asemalecha shalom May Adonai bless you and keep you today. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance over you and grant you his peace. In the name of the Sar Shalom, the, the Prince of Peace, Yeshua of Nazareth, and all of us who are with him to the end say, Amen, the Amen. Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Shavua Tov, men's prayer here, 8.15 Tuesday night. Women's prayer, 7 p.m. at Regina's house. We'll see you back here on Shabbat. We'll continue in the Gospel of Luke. Shalom, everybody.